This is The Bandwagon, powered by Ram Trucks, a show about baseball, which is famously a zero-sum game. Uh, it always leaves people disappointed. I am Hannah Kaiser, a baseball writer at Yahoo Sports, joined, as always, by Zach Kreiser, also a baseball writer at Yahoo Sports. Hello. Hello. It's been a pretty uh, bleak week of baseball here in New York, huh? Yeah. Not Well, yes. I was wondering where you were going, and then you added the qualifier in New York, and it became somewhat undeniable. We, do you want to just hop right in? <laughs> I, I think we have to hop right in. I think we can uh, hop right in. I let's 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 start with the less depressing of the less two existential. New York teams. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The more just kind of like sometimes your best player is hurt and then your team is less good. Okay, Aaron Judge stubbed his toe, but like a more extreme version on June third, and to cut to the chase, in the time since then, the Yankees. Are the are last in team runs scored in all of Major League Baseball, like behind the A's, behind the Royals, behind the Nationals. That's bad. It is. Uh, and then this weekend, Aaron Judge talked to reporters, and uh, he'd been on the IL because of the toe injury that he suffered, kept making a catch through a wall at Dodger Stadium. But what we found out this weekend is that he actually tore a ligament in the toe, which is worse than we knew for sure. Uh, and ligament tears take a while. I'm not a doctor. I don't know exactly how long, but he cannot yet run, uh, or at least as of Saturday, he could not run. So we are looking at a kind of more prolonged Aaron Judge absence than we thought, and if you've watched the rest of the Yankees lineup at any point over the last two years, you know that the Yankees without, without Aaron Judge is not pretty. So that's where we're at with the Yankees and in the AL East, that is a pretty precarious situation. Yes. This made me think of a story, a really good story that you wrote last year, just because the Yankees happened to be struggling. Aaron judge was still there, still hitting home runs, uh, notably so, but they had cooled off from their incredibly hot start to the season. And you did a really good story sort of looking at the total lack of production underneath Aaron Judge or sort of beyond Aaron Judge. And at the time, you were writing about this from the perspective of like Aaron Judge is going to be a free agent at the end of the year. And they really got to not only bring him back, but potentially do more than just bring him back. And I was thinking about that because I had also thought about that story when they signed Aaron Judge and they had this introductory press conference in New York and this is getting into stuff that people don't care about, but I forgot to tell the Yankees I was coming, and then they didn't give me... Uh, then apparently our BBWA cards didn't get us in, so I went home and watched it on TV. But <laughs> doing so allowed me to see the sort of like television um, Yes Network interviews that they were doing, and one of the things that came up, I don't even remember who they were asking. It might have been Boone, Aaron Boone, or Brian Cashman, but somebody was asked, like, does this, re-signing Aaron Judge give you the pieces necessary to get over the Astros hump that you guys keep running into in the postseason, forcing whoever it was that was fielding this question to be like, well, he was on the team last year. <laughs> and <laughs> we so, did not get over the hump then. <laughs> so we have exactly the same team in terms of the offense. <laughs> and yes, like that is, that that is, I mean, which is not to say that they shouldn't have, like signing Aaron Judge, Great move. Fantastic move. 10 out of 10. No notes. Great, great job by Cashman and Hal Steinbrenner and all of that. But as we are seeing, like the, the offense is a year older. Anthony Volpe got off to a very exciting start. He's still Anthony Volpe has a very interesting quality where when you see him make good plays or have a really exciting game on the base paths, it seems like, wow, it's a great player. I can't believe he's so young. And then you look at his numbers and you're like, oh, he's actually he's having, young. A, yeah, he's he's having he's... a really bad season. Having a tough time. Yeah. I find the Yankees' uncertainty with regards to Aaron Judge's injury timeline to be very concerning. Um, the owners' meetings were recently, I talked about that on the podcast, going to the owners' meetings. Probably I just talked about the part where Rob Manfred spoke. But also Hal Steinbrenner, owner of the Yankees, spoke. And of course, I was not that interested in the Aaron Judge questions because I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Let's get to the like owner le ownership level stuff. But a lot of Yankees beat reporters were there. They were asking about Aaron Judge. And in one of his answers, he said something about this being, you know, a, a rare injury. And Brian Hoke, MLB.com's Yankees reporter, 
very smartly picked up on this and followed up and was like, I'm sorry, you said it was a very rare injury because at the time they were still kind of maintaining this like, yeah, he's pretty close to baseball activities. It's just a matter of pain management. Uh, and and Hoke followed up and was kind of like, does that mean that you don't really have any idea? <laughs> and I as mean, it turns the, out, yes. At the time, the explanation of the injury was pretty much like his toe hurts. And it's like, yes. well, yes, you know. Everyone has experienced that when you walk too close to your couch. Like, that's not a rare injury at all. So, yeah. I, I mean, it's really interesting if you just think back to the play itself and the sort of day following the play where it seemed like this is a another shining example of Aaron Judge's all-around contribution and, and he's more than just a home run hitter. I mean, it is a... This is a real loss. Like when he was on pace for all these home runs earlier in the season and everybody felt like, who says he's not capable of putting up this, you know, a, a repeat or a, an improved season on his historic 62 home runs. And it's like, well, that's really contingent on health. Like he was really healthy last year. OK, so that's one New York team's existential dread. Before we get to the other New York team's existential dread, we're going to talk about some other news in baseball. I wanted to talk about this. I don't have no I have no idea if you want to talk about this. Last week, so for Thursday and Friday, I believe, Wander Franco, superstar of the Rays, was benched for being a bad teammate. And the Rays were completely explicit about this, like, all around. In fact, they spoke to Franco beforehand. I thought this was interesting. He was already not at the ballpark by the time media was allowed in the clubhouse. But Kevin Cash, the Rays manager, led off his pregame media session by announcing this, by announcing that Franco would be out of the lineup Thursday night and, and also Friday due to the culmination of several issues. Mark Tompkin, who does an excellent job covering the Rays and has covered them since their entire existence, so like he is the institutional knowledge in Tampa, detailed as much as he knows about some of these, but the details, like the, the phrasing of the details are so strange to me. So this was his list. Several verbal altercations with teammates, including one with Randy Rosarena, May 23rd, not hustling on the base pass or after balls in the field, most recently after an errant throw in Sunday, Sunday in San Diego, and being overly em emotional in reacting to unsuccessful at-bats, such as slamming bats and throwing equipment in front of, and at times endangering, teammates as he did after making an out Wednesday. Which is only interesting to me because there's not like one None of those sound like massive blow up. No. So does that make you feel better or worse about them taking this level of extreme but also measured? It, sound it makes me feel like this is a teaching moment that would only be a teaching moment when you are so far out in front as the best team in baseball, which they're not actually that far out in front anymore, but... I don't think they would do this if they were like one game up in the wild card race. If you want me to take a, an estimation there, I, I don't think they would be doing this. But, you know, it seems like they were very forthright about it. It seems like there's not a lot of controversy about mm -hmm. it, which I guess is, you know, we've seen some crazy controversies before where a younger, often Latin player is benched. And it seems like it's not something that would have happened to a an American white guy veteran. So I, you know, at least there seems to be a little bit more consideration in this than there often are for like, that guy's not hustling, get him off the field right now. Uh, right. So that's all fine. I don't know if, uh, I just don't know what to make of it because it, it, there is nothing in there that screams, man, this guy's really putting his, uh, you know, his himself before his team or something. There's not, a you know, smoking gun well and i think there's like two different ways you can interpret this and i enjoy the rays play this year and i particularly enjoy watching wander franco and i think the rays do a really good job like as an organization i'm i mean i'm not biased but i just made no bones of having that opinion and so the i think the the positive spin to me this reads so differently than for example the way that ali marmal and the cardinals handled well, Tyler O'Neill, Tyler O'Neill, but yeah. then also like demoting Jordan Walker, like all that. This reads very differently, and so in response to your sort of concerns, yes, I, I, true, I, I agree. I don't think they'd be doing this if the games were of utmost importance at the moment. But I don't know that that necessarily undermines it. I think they know that they've made a really long term commitment to this player, 
if they see a behavior that they think is like potentially going to compound over time that they don't want to manifest at a less opportune time <laughs> and they think that now is the best way to address it or the best time to address it that seems smart and yeah, also he he went two for four the home run in his first game back. I just I think that they they seemingly have handled this in a way that does not uh ha has not fractured their relationship with Franco, or at least not that we know of, any more than it was before. If he didn't like them already or something, baseball operations president of Eric Neander said there are numerous sensitivities associated with this being handled publicly, but greater accountability was required to respect our clubhouse and while continuing to support Wander. That's been something that's come up a ton in all of this. Is like we really support Wander. All this is done to support Wander. Zach Eflin had incredible quotes which I sent to you. That was just like I really love him and he needs a lot of love and which kind of makes me think that they are helping him to address potentially some personal issues or some just anger management issues like a, a, away from the field behind the scenes like this to me reads as something that like the player was involved in or at least made aware of before the the media was certainly like this reads to me more as like something that they actually did kind of carefully plan i'm sure they carefully planned it to coincide with games that they thought they could win without him or whatever uh and yeah i don't know We'll see how it goes from here. It does seem like potentially credit again to Mark Tompkins for pulling this detail. Apparently, the day that he came back, they all wore Randy and Rosarena shirts like for batting practice, one of those like cute, fun graphic shirts that baseball teams always have. And Wander Franco did not wear the Randy and Rosarena <laughs> t-shirt. So, so something to some watch there. Potential beef. <laughs> uh, the trade deadline approacheth. A little Has over it. a month. As it always yeah. does. It's not enough for us to talk about it in the main segment. No. But it, but it was enough for John Morosi to tweet, the Pirates are likely to be deadline sellers because how the mighty have fallen. Uh, Andrew McCutcheon, enjoying his best offensive year since 2015, is a fascinating trade candidate. McCutcheon, 36, has never played in a World Series. One option for the Bucks, a summer trade and a winter reunion. So trading him to a contender for the rest of the season and then re-signing him in the winter. Uh, Zach, please take it away with what you texted I, me. <laughs> okay, yes. So Andrew McCutcheon, as you may recall, famously on the Pirates before, won an MVP. And then when they were realizing that their mid-2010s core was no longer going anywhere, they traded him to the Giants and they got back Ryan Reynolds, who they now is one of their best players and they signed him to an extension. Now they have McCutcheon again and they could trade him again, get back another player that they make part of their core and then re-sign McCutcheon again. I just, you know, the Pirates, I don't think are going to be like winning the World Series next year. So they're if they keep re-signing McCutcheon every season, they could just keep trading him to try to get him a <laughs> ring and then bringing him back for the off season. Heartwarming story. Trade him again. It's like, they're going to try to build the whole boat out of Andrew McCutcheon trades and also Andrew McCutcheon at any given time until the boat is built. You know, uh, Sam Miller has written pretty extensively about the Delman Young trade tree in Tampa Bay that basically they traded Delman Young once like in 2008 and they are still reaping benefits from all of the players they have gotten from this tree, which includes Tyler Glass now. Uh, so... I'm envisioning a Pirates trade forest of Andrew McCutcheon where they just keep trading him and getting him back and trading him again until they have a good team. It's a tree that's shaped like one Andrew McCutcheon and then a very wide base of Andrew McCutcheon trade returns. I, 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 that is delightful. I don't know. I hope I enjoy that as a thought experiment and it feels incredibly Pirates. Like that feels like the natural end point or next step for the Pirates. And it seems like a this is what I texted you in response. Seems like a lovely final chapter of a player's career. Just like he just, just, just every spring delighting the Yinzers of Pittsburgh by re signing with the Pirates. Oh my God, I'm so excited to come back. Uh, and then every late summer and fall playing on a contender, going for that World Series ring, rinse and repeat. Love that for Andrew McCutcheon. That's what Andrew he, McCutcheon He deserves. never, yeah, he never has to change his spring training home. He yes. lives in the same place he's always lived for most of the season and then just goes off, chases a ring, comes back and, you know, he, he doesn't have to deal with any of the logistical issues. Brings back those winning ways. He's just like a 
He's like exporting good vibes from Pittsburgh and importing winning mentality from he's wherever pretty he much goes. a spy. But, yes. you know, it works. Everyone loves him. So he no one cares. I would love for that to happen. Where would this is forget the logistics of the trade and how much sense it would make just on like Andrew McCutcheon would be fun to watch play in the postseason. Where would you like him to end up? Mm. Well, there's there was already a rumor about the Rangers being interested, which feels like a pretty good one of, uh, you know, love the Rangers. We wrote a story about them that's publishing today. Uh, they are a pretty serious bunch. They could so use some fun. They, they could use some <laughs> leavening. And Andrew McCutcheon is both good and fun. So, you know, he won't be confused for a prankster, but he is a veteran with presence who also, you know, has some fun with it. So I would put him I would put him in Texas. I want him to be on like an even I kind of I want him to be on the Reds if they're going for it. Okay. I don't think the Pirates are gonna trade him to the Reds. <laughs> I don't uh, think so either. <laughs> no. I just mean like like the Rangers keep your serious men your serious vibes. Uh, we did not watch the London series. No, uh, <laughs> we did not. But I will say a thing that came out around the same time as the Cardinals Cub series in London, which they have played in London before. I don't understand why the stadium is so conducive to home runs, but it is whatever. They've done that before. What MLB also announced was a game in Birmingham, Alabama at an old Negro Leagues field where Willie Mays originally uh, came up and that is going to happen next summer. Uh, the Giants and the Cardinals are going to play there and that is terrific. I'm looking forward to that. I think this, is, you know, it'll be nationally televised just like the Field of Dreams game was uh, with the White Sox and Yankees. And I think that's a tremendous idea. I'm looking forward to seeing that game, going to that game and experiencing all of the things that go with that. So kudos for that. I don't care that much about the English folks who got to see some <laughs> cricket adjacent uh, sporting, but uh, the game in Birmingham should be excellent. Yeah, that's at Rickwood Field and Hall of Famer Willie Mays, who is now 92 and who played for the Birmingham Black Barons, said in a statement, amongst other things, a long statement, but it ended, we can't forget what got us here, and that was the Negro Leagues for so many of us. I... I am much more interested in the overarching point that is Major League Baseball staging games at unconventional locations than I am in the sort of like specifics of the game themselves. I would like to go to that one in, in Birmingham next year for sure. But I just mean like I didn't not watch the London games because I don't like that they're playing games in London. I love that they're playing games in London. There's also been reports I think that they're considering playing games in Paris. That's also very cool. I like all the conversations that people have about where MLB should or could stage games because I think actually in some ways is like is like more surprising than we even give it credit for this feels in some ways very contrary to mlb as a league being in some ways more resistant to change than the other leagues however what they have is on the flip side of that is that major league baseball can be played at non uniform dimensional stadiums. I didn't phrase that correctly, but you all know what I mean. And that is a delightful quirk. That's one of my favorite things about baseball that is unfortunately going away as ballparks become more standardized. But that is a delightful quirk that opens up the opportunity to do things like this. And Major League Baseball leaning into that, leveraging that for a way to make some of the many, 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 many regular season games more distinct and more interesting. It's it's only good. It's only good that they are doing this. I did not care about watching the Cardinals play the Cubs for two games in London. Let's get to a segment we're calling Built Different, powered by Ram Trucks. Sometimes you see a guy whose performance is game-changing and think he is just built different. Zach, who amazed you this week? That's what I'm supposed to tell you or yes. ask you. But specifically, I'm going to say, who would you like to see amaze you in the Home Run Derby? That is how we are interpreting the prompt this week. All-Star Game also approacheth, even before the trade deadline. The best part of the All-Star Game, broadly speaking, week. is the Home Run Derby. And who would you like to see unconventional Yes, addition. a built different version built of the home run derby. Home run. So not Pete Alonso, although I, I hope Pete Alonso defends. I, his... I feel like he will defend. So I was thinking, you know, what's a type of player who could be in the home run derby who just isn't? And I got to thinking about the home run derby curse where a guy who's really good goes into the home run derby. And then because law of averages, 
he's just not as good in the second half. And everyone blames the home run derby. So I was trying to think of a guy who really hasn't had it work out yet, who could go in the home run derby, and then we could credit the home run derby for making him great when he shows up in the majors and finally succeeds. So I went with Joe Adele, the Angels' former top prospect who has not yet stuck in the major leagues. He hit a home run in AAA this year that is the longest home run stat cast has ever tracked at any level. It was well over 500 feet. He is really fun to watch swing and hit the ball. He does not do that very often in actual game, you know, play. But in the home run derby, I feel very confident he would hit the ball and that it would go very far. And I think having kind of a minor league prospect adjacent guy to show the world in a way that doesn't require him to, you know, hit 280 or strike out less than 30% of the time could be a really fun way to show some talent without the pressure of the majors and, and maybe, you know, help him uh, launch pad into uh, success. Okay. We interpreted this the same way. And yet you thought my pick was a boring one. I thought for sure this was going to be like, a, Oh, but I went with Christian <laughs> Yelich and I know that he has an MVP. And I know that in the past he has been invited to participate in the home run derby. And he said he was going to, and then eventually he had to pull out because of injury. But the whole thing with Christian Yelich is that he's not been good lately. And a lot of that, or some of that, is attributable to his launch angle being quite low. And I also thought, like, who is someone for whom we could say, wow, the home run derby fixed their swing? And I was like, that would be really cool. Christian Yelich, who currently is in the 95th percentile for average exit velocity, the 97th percentile for hard hit percent, but uh, who has an average exit or an average launch angle of 5.8 degrees. I think he should just be put in a situation in which they're like, keep swinging hard, just aim very differently. Aim up. <laughs> aim up. The balls are pretty juiced, I feel like, in the home run derby. <laughs> and so he'll get that kind of positive reinforcement. And then he'll think I should do that more often. And then that'll be good for the Brewers, who have excellent pitching as always, and not a lot happening offensively. You're, un I, you're unimpressed with it. this pick. I'm okay, fine. It. All right, yeah, fine. I'm also, we, we should say that we wanted Pete Alonso to defend. I understand, but actually he did not win last year. Juan Soto won last year. I do remember that. I just, I'm operating under the assumption that Juan Soto won't want to do it again and that Pete Alonso will, but that's just a personal assumption. I don't, I'm not basing <laughs> that on any insight. <laughs> do you think Juan Soto will defend? Uh... No, but I don't have a good reason for thinking that. I don't either. I just think, I don't know, something about like the, the, the not having a good year. He wasn't great in the second half. Wasn't great in the postseason. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'll be wrong. That was built different, powered by Ram trucks, built to surf. Okay. Do you have a game for me? I do have a game. If you have been on baseball Twitter at all in the past month or so, you have seen the emergence of a wordle for baseball type deal that is called uh, the Immaculate Grid. And obviously that, you know, goes after the Immaculate Inning where you're supposed to make nine correct guesses in nine tries. We are not going to do nine. We are going to do a smaller grid of four that is okay. very tailored to your interests. So here's how the grid looks. So uh, you you know how this game works. Basically, you're looking for. I in just each box. recently learned how this game works. I I yeah allowed my eyes to glaze over them as they filled my Twitter feed, and then finally, um, Jake, my husband, was like, "Let's do it," and I was like, "I don't want to learn it." I'm <laughs> I'm I'm actually upset that you tailored this to my interests because it will be all the more embarrassing if I don't uh -huh. do well. All right, it, that's the point. Yes. So <laughs> the the point is, there's two things on the top two things on the side it's a team or a stat that a player accomplished you have to name a player who fits both so either a player who played for both teams or a player who did the stat thing while they were on the other team so yeah, it's giving pun and square i know how this yes work. uh so on the top of your grid we have the philadelphia phillies and 33 or more homers in the side of the grid we have the new york mets and the tampa bay rays uh, so let's go for the first box first on the top left. That is a player who played for the Mets and the Phillies. Taiwan Walker. Boom. Okay. That was not who I thought you would go with there, but. Who did you think I would go with? Lenny Dykstra. Uh. Oh, that's all. Awesome. Okay. Well. Next. 
Uh, we'll go a player who played for the Phillies and the Rays. Zach Eflin. Okay, we are going extremely <laughs> recent history. Uh, 33 homers for the Mets. Okay, this is really dumb. In a, in a season, in a season, yeah. Oh, gosh. Some Mets fans are losing their minds at how uh-huh, stupid probably. this is. Oh, Pete Alonso. Yes. Okay, sorry. Uh, and I was trying to think more historically. because. Uh, okay. I think this will be the harder one. 30, 33 homers for the Rays. Oh my gosh. Um oh. No. Okay. There are there are eight correct answers. There are eight correct answers? Yes. Are any of them recent? <laughs> yes. There um, have been uh four oh, since twenty seventeen. No, I'm not good at this. Okay, sorry. I'm very sorry. I'm I'm stalling. I'm gonna get I'm gonna uh, I know that I'm like missing from like the early rays. I'm sure there were some. I'm well, just the early like... rays were bad, so there weren't that many. <laughs> what was the most recent year that this happened? 2021. Okay. Who do I think did this in 2021? <laughs> That's the one that I'm going to go for. <laughs> uh, Josh Lowe? Was he even like, no, that's no, not really right. No. Brandon Lau is okay. an answer. All right. Uh, as the, the one I thought you might get was Evan Longoria did it twice. Okay. Um, yes. That was the one that I was like, who was that? That perennial Ray? Did Kevin Kiermaier ever do it? No, no. He's never hit that many home runs. Uh, okay. The other one that you, you know, I don't think you necessarily would have jumped to this name, but I, you do like him uh, as, a, <laughs> as an interview source is Mike Zanino did it. Mike Zanino did it? Oh my yes. God! Congrats to Mike Zanino. So. Is he playing baseball somewhere right now? I saw he got DFA. I don't know about right now. He got the <laughs> but he's my pick for a current player most likely to become a manager. Yeah. Very smart player. Just also hit homers for the Rays once. Not lately. All right, what's left? That's it. That was all. Oh, four. that was it. You, yeah, you did okay. three out of four. Seventy-five percent. That's you. Thank you for tailoring it to my interests. That was not as. Uh, embarrassing as I thought it was going to be. We'll, we'll go all all the way to nine some other week. All right. All right. We're going to take a quick break and come back with an existential crisis. So, as I'm sure you could have deduced from our, our little uh, tag there, this is the segment where we're going to talk about the Mets. We're not just going to talk about the Mets, but the Mets are a team that might be giving you an existential crisis. They're certainly giving Buck Showalter an existential crisis, who is wondering, and we were also wondering, would you want to know when you're going to die? Yes. So Buck Showalter, Mets manager, loves to answer press like normal. No, he loves to not answer. (laughs) Hold on. He loves to answer them by going on non sequitur rants that do not answer the question. And so... The Mets beat asked, uh, this was relayed by Tim Healy from Newsday. Uh, They asked who Tuesday's tonight's starter was going to be. Uh, This was over the weekend. And Buck Showalter said, quote, what is it with knowing about things before they happen? Do you want to know about when you're going to die? So we're not going to go non sequitur. We're going to answer Buck's question. Uh, What do you think? A hundred percent. The only people who don't want to know when they're going to die are people who are in denial about your own their own mortality. Like you are go- like people who don't want to know are just like, oh, I don't want to think about that. And it's like, grow the f- up and know when you're going to die like the rest of us. <laughs> but the rest like, of you don't know when you're going mean, to like, die. But I mean, like the rest, of, like everyone who has everyone who has thought about death would want to know. The, the actual practical, logistical, emotional, psychological benefits of knowing so vastly outweigh not knowing. The only benefit of not knowing is it allows you to maintain the fiction that you are uniquely immortal and that uh, you'll be forever young. You, you don't have to have the fiction that you're immortal to not want to. OK, so here's here's my question. You say that, but you have a guess, right? You, you're thinking of what the answer is going to be. And you're probably envisioning like, you know after a long illness at 87 or something, right? 
Yes. And if it's before that, if I'm going to die when I'm 35, I'd like to adjust my stress level between now and then about like spending money frivolously or whatever. <laughs> like, yeah, I, but that's my point. My point is like, would it suck to find out that you're going to die young? Of course. It would also suck to die young. And at least if you know, like, being able to spend the holidays with your family instead of working or something because you're on deadline, if you know you're going to die at like 42, definitely take that. I don't think I don't think I would react well to finding out I'm going to die at 38 or whatever. So like, yeah, if I could guarantee the answer was in like 57 years, I would love to know. But oh I God. don't really Dying? want to go into the I don't really want to go into the question sight unseen. You know, you don't actually know the answer. So the you're 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 not you can't assume what the answer is. So you Dying have young to is just, even more reason to know, I think. Were you like not going to take a trip to Paris because you're worried about saving for a down payment if you're going to die in six months? Truly, though, like if you're going to die young, that's not the all only the consideration to know. What are the other considerations? That you have to think about it for every second <laughs> from then until it happens. Yeah, but I'm going to do that anyway. This is just that, like that might so be true for you, but that would vastly so alter my psychology. Yeah. Last last night, this is going to be a really. We should maybe edit this out. Last night we we're like getting into bed, and I was like saying to Jake, I was like, I've been really loving you lately. You're probably going to die in a car crash because I said that, and he was like, Whoa! Why would you say? <laughs> right before i went into bed and i was like that's just how i think i've been really happy and um i assume that means disaster is right around the corner okay that's not actually what we're going to talk about <laughs> but yes to be clear i don't want to know i do not oh, want to know in case right. the argument was unclear i do not want to know this is the this is we've really drilled down to the heart of the difference between you and i yeah. I want to know for all among, of y'all. Among the differences, yes, that is. <laughs> and, and I wish I knew when everyone I met was going to die, and I would tell them too. Um, but I would mostly want to know for me. I think about death all the time. Why not? No. I do think if you knew you were going to die young, you'd be really caught up in like trying to prevent it. And I don't know in this magical scenario as laid out by Mets manager Buck Walter, if yes. it is inevitable or can you change it? I, I think... Based on what we've seen from the Mets, they are not hung up on the preventing it part uh, yes. because things are going downhill very quickly. <laughs> OK, so the Mets are actually a jumping off point for a much bigger question that I think about a lot. Is it per not not when I'm going to die? Other things um, and that I think about a lot as it pertains to baseball and that I think it really gets at the heart of how people feel about the Mets in particular, but also like the Padres and the White Sox. And there are a lot of teams that fall into this category that make me wonder, would we rather teams try consistently, try every year, every year think they're going to contend and fail sometimes because they can't be in the postseason every year or accept that there are cycles of contention and rebuilding and do this kind of like up and down wave thing. Sometimes you're selling off, sometimes you're buying. I have no idea. You called this the baseball fan Rorschach test. Like, would you rather enter the season with a really good shot of being in the postseason or with a medium shot of making the postseason? If it, well, I and, think it, yeah. it's a lot of, uh, I think since the Cubs and Astros did their famous teardowns and came back and won the World Series, baseball fans have sort of gotten an illusion that they just can know what a season is going to be about uh you know they can say well for the next three years we're just gonna watch the prospect lists be bad at the major league level watch for the next good team then the next good team is gonna show up and we're gonna contend for a while and then we're gonna do it again and like you're never gonna be surprised that much one way or the other you know you can be surprised that your team like the Orioles this year is not just on the cusp of contention, but actually contending. Sure, that's a nice surprise, but it's directionally not a surprise. Right. And I think that's kind of I think it's an illusion. I mean, we've seen the Phillies try a rebuild and approximately zero of the people from the rebuild had anything to do with their uh, return to contention. It was like two, but you know, very, the rebuild did not work. And I think we are getting to where more of these teams are constantly, you know, trying to go for it. And some teams are disappointed. And the way we talk about it in baseball circles 
kind of puts the harshest spotlight on the teams that try really hard and don't mm-hmm. quite make it. And that is not, I don't find that to be a great phenomenon uh, because it makes it feel like the Mets and Padres in particular set themselves on the highest ledge to fall from when, yes. I don't know, it's a season. They're all falling from the same ledge. It's just there's some more money on the ledge for some of them. Wow, you did an excellent job summing this up. I was very articulate. Yeah, this is in some ways, this is the biggest possible topic. Like this is all of it. Well, we could have picked any one specific avenue to sort of drill in on like, right, how do we feel about big team spending and disappointing? But I think you you picked exactly what I think, which is like there were some extremely high profile examples of teams tanking, rebuilding, it landing them a World Series, which perhaps begat a mini generation of teams doing that and then in the flip side in some ways all the dodgers sustained success begat this other kind of mini generation of teams being like no no, no we want to do that and those things can coexist in the same league but not all of the teams can make the postseason even in the year in which the sort of boom and bust teams think they're going to make the postseason and the teams that are always trying to make the postseason are going to make the postseason i think Major League Baseball teams themselves don't know which of these things is better. Truly, like, they're, you know, whether it is better to give yourself, like, if your utmost goal, which it is, is to just win a World Series. If that's the the one thing, if you are a baseball executive and your goal at some point during your career is to win the World Series, is the best path to give yourself as many shots at the World Series as possible, building, like, 93 win team after 93 win team that consistently makes the postseason but maybe isn't overpowering or is it to sort of push all your chips in whatever year looks like it's going to be your year and see if you can sort of survive the relative uncertainty but not total uncertainty of October. Our particular interest in this right now is born of the Mets in in particular but also a conversation that I was having with somebody at Major League Baseball in which I was talking about how the thing that you were referencing, the the Cubs and the Astros, how that little mini generation of baseball and just in general, our ability to project things has given way to a league full of executives who seem to think that future wins are more easily guaranteed than current wins. They yeah. all seem to be operating under the assumption that they will be better in three years. Line go that, up. It's like the stock market. It's like the line always goes up. And it's like, exactly. well, no, it, it doesn't. <laughs> and that leads me back to the thing that I am always saying, which is like, it's a closed system. You cannot all get better. Some of you should just be pushing all the shit. Ch- like, this is your year. This is your best shot. Like, to me, I think that that was last year for the Mets. In some ways, I think like the flaws now go back to the fact that like, you should have just gone bigger at the trade deadline last year. Um, I also just think that like they didn't and that's great because they thought they were going to be good two years in a row. Isn't that what fans want? So I was looking back in September 2019, my first year in this job, I wrote a column that said uh, there was a very strong argument to be made that the health of a sports league is reflected in how many fan bases are heartbroken on the first day of the playoffs. That was basically just what we were talking about now, which is like if every if you went Hal Steinbrenner always says like. I just want every fan base to think on opening day that they have a shot. And if that's the case, then 18 of them will be the subject of where did it all go wrong? Who should get fired? How could they screw this up? They spent all this money discourse over the course of the season, or at least at the end of the season. And the Mets and Padres in particular are falling victim to that now. So... Yeah, and I will say the you mentioned the the tanking mini generation, and now we've got the Dodgers sustained success mini generation. I I want to talk about the Giants, uh, who are maybe the most emotionally pure of these teams, in that they had just the season dropped from heaven itself in 2021, win 107 games out of literal nowhere, uh, and that was preceded by former Dodgers right hand man Farhan Zaidi taking over, mm-hmm. and. When Farhan took over, everyone thought that he was going to tear the team down. You know, there was Brandon Belt, there was Brandon Crawford, there was Buster Posey, who, you know, had sort of been coming off injuries. 
And everyone thought he was just going to trade everyone away, start over. And he did not do that. He kept all of them. He just kind of put some new things around them. He did nothing that would categorize as a splash at all. And this team won 107 games. And last year, they also did nothing that would categorize as a splash. And they weren't very good. They were disappointed. They were a team that was disappointed. But they weren't disappointed in the Mets and Padres way. They were disappointed in the stay level and it didn't work out way. And now this year, they're competing again in after famously trying to make some splashes and then not making any splashes. So I just I think that a lot of teams are probably going to look at the Giants and say, oh, we could try this way. I think it's really hard. I I think that's really, really hard. And we're going to have our own version of that not working out like the tanks did. But I don't think that it is I think it is viewed as less risky and kind of inherently better if you are a baseball team or a baseball fan to do the Giants way because it isn't as wild a swing from happiness to sadness and back. Mm -hmm. But I don't I think the wild swings of happiness, you know, the Mets at least had the great day when they signed Justin Verlander. You know, that was fun. It's been bad since then, but (laughs) they they had, you know, if the Giants get the last wild card spot and go out in two games. I think the Mets will have had the more human experience season, which I don't know. That's why you watch sports, right? That's such a, I want to come back to like your ultimate take, but I appreciate that you brought up far on Tahiti because it allows me to talk about something that I wanted to talk about, which is that ahead of that 2021 season where they had so much success. So now I'm like referencing reporting I did years ago, but I talked to Farhan Zahidi and specifically was like, everybody thought you were going to tear down when you when you came in and you didn't do that. You still have all these veterans. What's that about? And he said, uh, it is my personal belief that baseball is a sport that is less conducive to the tear down and rebuild model than other sports in the NBA or the NFL. You can get a LeBron James or a franchise quarterback in the draft and the baseball draft is way more of a crapshoot and is less of a guarantee of success. And I think in baseball, the way the industry is set up, the way our farm systems are set up, the depth of free agency, every team has opportunities to really turn their fortunes around every off season. That was part of like a longer, more extensive quote. But I think he says it really well. I think there's so much, so many ways that we can take this. The every year one team wins the World Series and it is tempting to retrofit the best possible team building strategy to whatever it is that they did that led them there. But all of these team building strategies are competing with one another in a space where only some of them can succeed. And so to like end up where you ended up, I am surprised that you are of the mindset that like go big. If it doesn't work, at least you had the experience of going big. Just because I think we tend to think of like the quote unquote smarter model to be tinker in the off season every year, continue to give yourself your teams a chance, but don't fall victim to the putting all your eggs in one basket and then having to rebuild next year version. I will say I am pro go big from a emotional fan perspective. I don't think it's the smarter model. I, I think <laughs> oh, that's okay. almost the problem. I think winning baseball games, if you want your, you know, optimal chances of winning each season, which, you know, is probably what you want to do if you're a GM or the owner of a team. Yeah, I, I think the the Giants model, the Rays model, the whoever you want to pick model is better, you know, ideally you're just a Dodgers fan and they do both at the same time. And like, that's what everyone's trying to do all the time, but that's not really realistic for most of them. And if I'm going to put myself through a season, I'd prefer they at least not all feel the same. Uh, you know, not I I'm, I'm writing something about this concept right now. Just like so much of baseball and the things that decide the outcome take place off stage. You don't see them. You don't see J.D. Davis go from the Mets to the Giants and learn to play third base. And so it kind of makes the trade deadline, the offseason, they make the, they feel like red herrings, right? And for the Mets, it was a red herring, but you can see the results. It is, you know signing Justin Verlander and Max Scherzer and not putting as much into the back of the rotation, not having as much depth. Padres, same thing with the back of their lineup, trading away all their younger guys who could have stepped into that role. They're getting a very pure response, input, output, it went boom. 
and that part of it of being able to see more of it both coming and once it has manifested i think that is a fuller experience i don't think it is a better way to build a baseball team though of course it could work one time and then you would be like oh actually it is the, like i mean not you specifically but right this well, that it, is it does work sometimes dave right, Dabrowski like, makes it work exactly. like every yes, five years like, yeah like every year one team has success and sometimes it's the teams that are trying to be sustainable and sometimes it's the teams that aren't trying to be sustainable and you're like ah Drats. Yeah. A- if I you actually think- want to find the best way to win a World Series is you're a baseball executive, do the Dave Dombrowski. Just put yourself in like Nashville in the catbird seat and just wait for the most World Series hungry, richest owner to come right. calling and just take that one. Yeah. I ultimately I think this is what we're getting at is just like I don't know. I don't know that we have an upshot other than like no. if it doesn't work, it's not necessarily an indictment of the plan because some of these plants have to not work in order for <laughs> the conceit of sports, which is like only someone emerges victorious to pan out. It is very interesting to look in retrospect at the Mets in particular. Like the Mets to me are the most interesting example of this because I am tempted to say their mistake was not going all in last year. Their mistake was trying to be the Dodgers when maybe they weren't there yet from like a player development perspective. But I don't know, they they could have gotten bumped in the division series last year. And then, you know what I mean? Like, it's like how much how much is every advanced round in the postseason worth versus another entire regular season of your fans thinking they have? Oh, it's very interesting. I don't know. I don't have a good way to wrap this segment. It becomes an arc. We think of it like an arc when really every team just kind of has its own every season is competing against different factors and you can't necessarily we can't say for sure that last year's Mets team if it were just like imported to 2023 with everyone being the same age they were last year the entire team being the same Edwin Diaz existing I, it's just uh, I don't know if they would be a 100 and win team I don't know if they would be in the division lead it's it's just not as easy to find the narrative as you want. So really, you're picking a a starting point for each season of whether you feel completely and totally pot committed to this season at the expense of all others or whether you are willing to play, you know, fantasy baseball on expert mode for the next 10 years to get what you want. And right. it's just kind of that how big is the the line of amplification on either side and both of those involve some level of disappointment whether that's yes disappointment because you thought they were going to contend and they're not or disappointment because how could they not even be trying so (laughs) pick your poison i guess sports they're built to break your heart a debate Uh, between giants and mets fans I, th- I'm gonna, I kind of feel like this relates to the team I am bandwagoning right now. I'm gonna bandwagon the Mariners because this is gonna be a true bandwagon. This is gonna sound like I'm, this is gonna be like a pity bandwagon, but it's not. It's just like a genuine, <laughs> like, I want them, I want them to win more than they are winning type bandwagon. Uh, remember last year when they made the postseason for the first time in a very long time and people were very happy? I do remember that. Yes, it was a fun time in Seattle. They won 90 games, uh, the same number of games that they had won in 2021. And I like couldn't shake this sense that I was like, God, I only made the postseason because it was expanded. Like this whole like (laughs) the drought is over thing is a very satisfying narrative. And it, it gave us an incredibly emotionally vast, varied, satisfying, uh, division series against the Astros. But from like a cold hearted mathematical perspective, I was like, are they actually better than all the teams that predated this Mariners team? Or are they just playing in a uh, baseball that has an expanded postseason field? And I really don't want it to be the latter. I want them to make the postseason again. So the catharsis of having made the postseason last year isn't kind of rendered moot by the like, well, maybe that was the fluke instead of like, that was the beginning of a new era of contention in Seattle. Uh, Currently, the Mariners, 38 and 39, that is below 500. However, 
it is much better than they were this time last year. This time last year, on this date, they were 34 and 41. They were also about to go into like a 14-game win streak that really, really turned the tides on, on their season. Also, they were playing in a much easier division. Uh, the Rangers and Angels, not nearly as formidable looking last year as they are this year. They've the Mariners are they've been a little bit better over the last month. They are ninth in team home runs and second in team FIP. And those stats are only a little bit cherry picked to like some things are going <laughs> the, well. The Mariners are a great half team. They have a tremendous pitching staff and they cannot hit anything. They cannot hit anything. And they are not the Yankees, and Julio Rodriguez is not Aaron Judge, but they are kind of that in that like Julio Rodriguez has been basically just a little bit better than league average this year and all of a sudden it feels like do they have no offense whatsoever and it's kind of like yeah they don't um and I don't know that he can carry the team himself because he doesn't hit 62 home runs but it feels very different I wrote about this this week I wrote about they were in New York and I went to see them and I I went in with this exact sort of premise of like you guys are in a better spot than you were last year i went in thinking that i was going to be like and i said this to everybody like that i saw the first day i was like this team are they good are they bad who can tell it feels like they're a little bit of both and everybody was like no they're they're bad and i was like <laughs> oh <laughs> the vibes are not great um and then they got yelled at by their managers got service and then they came out the next day and they scored a whole bunch of runs and they won i was like wow you fixed them skip and i don't know that he did but I don't, they, they, they're more fun when they're fun. I know that's true of every team, but they are, to relate it back to our last segment, they are a team that played an extremely long game. And Jerry DePoto, their lead, their top baseball executive, their president of baseball operations, Jerry DePoto has taken this approach of like, we're going to be extremely honest and upfront with the fans and super communicative. And we're going to tell them that we're doing this rebuild and it's going to take a long time, but then it's going to pan out. And like, Last year really looked like the, oh, that is the successful model. Everybody should do that kind of thing. And then it'll be really disappointing for fans if it's just like, nope, yeah. never mind. That's a, <laughs> that's a team that earned patience in the worst way by being so bad for so long that it was like, well, if he even has a thought of how he might get us to the playoffs, that's fine. Right. Uh, but then now the one time with a first round exit was, you know, that's not going to be. Excuse me, a second, oh, round, second exit. round exit. I'm sorry. Second round exit is not going to be the most exciting thing. So they kind of have to. They have to do it again. And it's not as simple as just taking last year's team and plopping it into a new season. It's a whole new challenge. And yes. uh, sometimes that challenge is going to be a different thing and they're going to have to add pieces which they sort of didn't really and, do. Yeah. I what I don't want for the Mariners is for them to be and this is not going to be a perfect analogy, but I don't want for them to be the White Sox, which is like a team that thought they were close and so then they tinkered a little bit and they tinkered a little bit and they tinkered a little bit and everybody was like, I don't know, they have good players, but like never quite enter this like true window of contention like i want last year to be the beginning of a window of contention for the mariners and not just like a little tiny peak in what is like a run of just around Middle, 500 yeah. seasons yeah because that's a really un that like of all the ways that <laughs> fans emotions can be played with in baseball that seems like the least satisfying is kind of the like you're disappointed every year that your team didn't do more because you saw how last year went but then you allow yourself to buy in and then it goes exactly the way that last year did like that's what i don't want for the mariners if only because julio rodriguez is a lot of fun and is a lot more fun when he is having fun and he is having fun when they are good also just because it's too late in the season it's like the end of june to be talking about last year but last year i went to that 18 inning the Astros beat the Mariners one to nothing in 18 innings to eliminate them from the postseason game and it just felt like nothing has ever been more narratively consistent with the broader <laughs> picture like I was like wow this is in fact one game that reflects the entire Mariners experience and at the end of that 
after they had been eliminated, after they had played an entirety of one single baseball game at home in however, what was it, like 21 years? They, they, yes. That was their first and last game that they played in T-Mobile Park in front of those fans uh, to end the drought. The fans stayed and they chanted like, let's go Mariners. And they were all like bittersweet and... I don't want that to curdle. Like truly, that's like that is my motivation in bandwagon. Am. Like I am like probably only one of them and the Angels can make the postseason. Probably only one of them and the Angels and the Astros can make the postseason, or even maybe the Rangers, depending on what happens with the Astros in the second half. But like, and I know that everybody else is on team get Shohei Otani and Mike Trout to the postseason, but I actually think like it would be sadder for the Mariners to miss the postseason and for their fans to be like, for their fans to go from like. We don't mind having waited. We're just happy we're there to like, what was all this for? <laughs> we are now sad. <laughs> yes. like, never mind. We are mad. <laughs> yes. Very like, very like, we don't, we're not mad at you, Jerry DePoto. We trust you to like, actually call him back. We are mad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't want that for them. Uh, that is all we've got time for you this week. Thanks again to our presenting sponsor, Ram Trucks. Make sure you are following both of us on Twitter. I am at Hannah R. Kaiser, and he is at Z Kreiser, as you may have noticed, they kind of rhyme. And if you've made it this far, please subscribe to the podcast and the YouTube channel. Leave us a five-star review, tell a friend, and we'll be back next week with another episode of The Bandwagon.